Oops. Welcome everyone. I just lost my um my little cheat sheet. Okay, it slipped behind my Zoom screen. These are the perils of Zoom hosting. I'm Cynthia Schrager and I'm a member of Hochmat and I have the pleasure tonight of welcoming all of you to this conversation between the scholar and author Daniel Matt and psychotherapist Estelle Friedman on the occasion of Daniel's new book Becoming Elijah. Daniel is a good friend of Hochmat and of course, a scholar of Kabbalah. His books include The Essential Kabbalah, translated into eight languages, God and the Big Bang, and his nine volume annotated translation, the Zohar Pritzker edition, which has been hailed as a monumental contribution to the history of Jewish thought. His new biography of Elijah, Becoming Elijah, Prophet of Transformation, has just been published by Yale University Press in their series, Jewish Lives. And Daniel told me he did a class on Elijah at Hochmat while he was working on the book, which was very helpful in his writing. So maybe some of you were there and will be thrilled to see how it has all unfolded. Um, we're gonna post a discount code for the book, um, for purchasing the book in the chat. And we encourage everyone to get this wonderful book. Daniel taught for many years at the Graduate Theological Union, and he currently teaches classes about the Zohar online. And we'll also uh, link to that in the chat in case anyone is interested in checking that out. 
Tonight, Daniel's going to be in conversation with Estelle Frankel, a longtime Folkmont member and one of the original instructors in our Jewish meditation program. She is a practicing psychotherapist who blends depth psychology with the healing, wisdom, and spiritual practices of the Kabbalah. Estelle has taught Jewish mysticism in Israel and throughout the US for over 40 years. She is the author of two award-winning books, Sacred Therapy and The Wisdom of Not Knowing. And Danielle and Estelle will be in conversation for about an hour. We'll have time for a few questions um, from the chat at the end. So please feel free to add your questions into the chat. We may not have time to get to them all, but we will definitely choose a few and we will end at approximately 7.15 PM. Um, if you appreciate special events like this, we hope you'll also consider donating to Hochmat. You can also sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss any of the wonderful events that we offer. And um, now is also a wonderful time to join Hochmat if you aren't already a member. As you probably know, we're embarking on a new chapter with a new spiritual leader, Zvika Krieger. Zvika is going to be leading his very first Shabbat service tomorrow night at 5.30 on Zoom, and we hope you'll join us. I am gonna turn it over to Estelle now to start this conversation. So um, it's an honor to be here tonight to be in conversation with my teacher, Danny, of many years. And first of all, I want to congratulate you on the publication of this wonderful book about perhaps one of the most fascinating characters in all of Jewish folklore. Um, this book, if you haven't already read it, is both academically erudite, yet completely readable, and not just readable, but beautifully written. As I was reading it, it was saving me from doom scrolling too much news over the past month. And I found myself highlighting many sentences and phrases and marinating in the beauty of the language that you use, Danny. So you describe this book as a biography of the prophet Elijah, and you describe it as a play in two acts. The first act being Elijah's life in scriptures in the Book of Kings, and the second act being his mythic mystical afterlife and it's a story that's still unfolding endlessly and we all participate in it so i'm wondering if you could begin by um, sharing a little bit about elijah's life and personality in scriptures and then we'll get into his evolution and transformation over the centuries Sure. It's great to be with you, Estelle, and with uh, Hochmat, and with all of you joining. Uh, Eliyahu is such a fascinating figure. Just his name itself is really electrifying. You know, many names in the Bible include a divine element, either El or Yah or Yahu. But Elijah is unusual in that he has a double dose of divinity. Eliyahu, my God, is yud heh vav -Hey, my God is Yahu. Yahu is simply an abbreviation for the full four-letter name, yud heh vav -Hey. So he's suffused with, with divinity. He's permeated with divinity. Uh, he appears suddenly, and he seems to appear and disappear already in the Bible. You know, we think of who Elijah becomes and all the, all the forms that he assumes in later Jewish tradition, but already in the Bible, he, he comes and goes mysteriously he surprises people. Uh, the first time we hear of him in the middle of the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 17, we hear nothing about his early history, nothing about his birth. Uh, he just appears, it says, uh, Elijah confronted King Ahab, the king of Israel, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel at the time. This is the ninth century BCE. And Elijah confronts Ahab and announces a drought. He brings a drought. You know, it's interesting that Elijah is the one who 
brings good news in later Jewish tradition. He's called the Mivaser, the harbinger of good news. But the first appearance we have of him is bringing some bad news. He brings bad news to the king and to all of Israel, declaring a drought, imposing a drought. Why? Apparently because of idolatry, because Ahab and the Israelites are attracted to the god Baal, the storm god of Canaan, one of the main Canaanite gods, to Baal and Asherah, to the masculine and feminine Canaanite divinities. The Israelites uh, are really torn between the worship of the one true God of Israel, but they're attracted also to the worship of Baal and Asherah. And because of that, Ahab, because of that, Elijah announces the drought. Uh, pretty soon he is uh, uh, associated with miracles. He has to flee from Ahab and Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, who's painted in very dark colors in the Bible. Uh, basically, Jezebel had, had introduced or had increased, I would say, the worship of Baal in Canaan. She was the daughter of a Phoenician, of a, Syri a Tyrian uh, immediately north of, of, of Israel, what today is Lebanon, the kingdom of Tyre in that time, T-Y-R-E. Jezebel is the daughter of a prince, of, a, of the king of Tyre, and she is married to Ahab as kind of a... Uh, diplomatic uh, arranged marriage to improve the relations between the two kingdoms, Israel and Tyre. So Jezebel comes to Ahab, but she brings along her own worship, her own priests, and the Israelites had already been introduced to Baal worship, but now many more of them are attracted to it. And Elijah basically forces the Israelites to choose. He, before too long, he uh, arranges with King Ahab for a contest on Mount Carmel, which of course is present day Haifa, a beautiful imposing mountain on the coast. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Those of you who have been to the Baha'i gardens there, those gardens really reflect uh, the beauty of, of, of the mountain in ancient times as well. So there's a contest on Mount Carmel between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. And Elijah says, who can bring down fire from heaven? Who can call upon their God and bring fire down to consume a sacrifice. So the prophets of Baal first try, Elijah lets them go first, and the people of Israel are, are there in attendance, many of them or thousands of them, according to the account in the book of Kings. And actually before the contest even begins, Elijah addresses the people and says, how long will you be hopping between the two branches, like a bird trying to find its perch on a tree? How long will you hop between the worship of Yudhevave and the worship of Baal and Asherah? And this contest is supposed to prove who is the true God. So the prophets of Baal begin trying to call down fire from heaven. After a few hours, Elijah mocks them. He says, maybe you should shout a little louder. Maybe your God is asleep. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he has to relieve himself. And uh, the prophets dance more wildly and begin gashing themselves, but still no response from Baal, no fire appears to consume their sacrifice. And then Elijah steps forward and almost immediately he calls upon God. And of course, fire comes down from heaven and consumes not only the offering, but the entire, it burns up uh, all of the altar and shars the ground around it. And Elijah has won the contest, it seems. The people are elated, and the people declare, according to the Book of Kings, Adonai Hu Ha Elohim, Adonai Hu Ha Elohim, Yudhevave is the true God. You may recognize that, that exclamation, that phrase, because it appears in the Jewish liturgy, in the Sidur, in the Machsor at perhaps the most dramatic moment of the entire Jewish year at the end of of Yom Kippur. Kol Nidre, the beginning of Yom Kippur is a dramatic moment. The end of Yom Kippur, the end of Ne'ilah is as dramatic or more dramatic uh, at Chochmat and many other, all synagogues in the world. And at the very end of the entire service of Yom Kippur, what do we chant? Adonai Hu Ha Elohim, Hashem Hu Ha Elohim, not two times like the Israelites did, but seven times. So it's one, one of many examples of how uh, Elijah influences Jewish tradition. So, so Danny, you're, you're describing 
the fiery energy of the prophet and his zealousness, his extreme monogamy that he wishes for the Jewish people. Um, he's sort of Haredi of Haredi. You know, here in uh, our times in Jewish renewal, we, we have hybrid uh, religion. We have hyphenated identities, but Elijah is clearly, you know, you're either with us or against us. You're, so if you could say a little bit about yeah. the zealousness, the zealotry and the, its place in Judaism and how the rabbis felt about that. Yeah, Elijah is, is the zealot. He's really the prototypical zealot of the, of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible. O only one other figure really would come to mind uh, to rival him or to be compared to him, and that is Pinchas, right? Pinchas, who appears in the Torah, and he kills two people who are fornicating as part of an orgiastic celebration of uh, the Moabite god. So Pinchas steps up and, and uh, kills those who are violating the covenant. And then Elijah, a few hundred years later, does the same thing. In fact, in an amazing thing, the, uh, there's a tradition that identifies Pinchas as Elijah, as if they were one and the same person, as if Pinchas lived long enough that he just became Elijah a few hundred years later. It's pretty unlikely, but it's amazing. But it's because of that, that quality of zeal. So there's a beauty to that. There's an intensity uh, that Elijah has, but it's extreme. And as you say, uh, you know, he he's he's in love with God. He's he's passionate in his devotion to God. But just as God is called El Kana, the zealous God or the jealous God, Elijah is that uh, that Kana, that Mikane. He is the the zealot. And the rabbis were, were troubled by this. For some of the rabbis, Elijah is, is too extreme. And really what the rabbis do is to, to refashion a, a Elijah. But, but before we come to that, let me go back to the, to the Bible for a moment. Uh, an example of his zeal we saw at, at Mount Carmel, immediately after that contest, which Elijah wins or God wins, uh, Ahab goes back to his palace seen according to the Bibles that Elijah runs in front of Ahab's chariot all the way from Mount Carmel to Ahab's winter palace. And that, this is the greatest moment of Elijah's career. He feels that he's brought the people back to the, to the belief in the one true God. But Ahab lets Queen Jezebel know what's happened and Jezebel wants to kill Elijah. Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah because he has defeated and slaughtered the prophets of Baal. So Elijah has to flee and he heads south to Beersheba and then further south and then into the Sinai desert. And he goes to Mount Sinai. He goes to Mount Chorev, which in Jewish tradition is the same as Mount Sinai. Just as Moses had a revelation at Mount Sinai, Elijah has a revelation at Mount Chorev. And God actually confronts him and says, Malachafo, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? You should be with, with your people. That may be the intent. You should be there trying to bring the people back to belief in Hashem. And Elijah responds, Kano kineti. I have been very zealous. That's how Elijah describes himself. He says, I've been fighting for you, but the people and the king and the queen are tearing down the, the altars and killing the prophets of, of the true God. So that's how Elijah describes himself. He is the zealot. And his zeal was so extreme that, as I said, the rabbis really uh, refashion him. They, they bring out his compassion. The journey here is really one of zeal to compassion. And that you could say is Eliyahu's tikkun. That's his repair, that, that's his mending, which takes hundreds of years and is still going on. Now, one thing I should say though, this isn't a, such, uh, it's not a, there are roots of Elijah's compassion in the Bible itself. He is a zealot, but he's also deeply caring about the people. Uh, he helps people in need already in the Bible. He revives a child who has died. 
And that's actually the first time in the entire Bible that we hear of revival of the dead. Elijah is, is later described as being immortal, and he overcame death uh, by saving the life of, of a little boy, according to the Bible. It seems like Elijah's transformation over time parallels the divine uh, transformation. And even Moses at that same mountain at Mount Horez has there's the first revelation and there's the second revelation of the Torah at Mount Sinai, Mount Horez. In the first revelation, God is El Kana, like Elijah, God is this jealous God. But the second revelation at Mount Sinai, um, Moses hears the 13 attributes of divine mercy. And Elijah go is going back to that very place where the last revelation was one of mercy. And God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Like, you don't belong here. This is the place of mercy. And, yeah, and not, maybe I, yeah. you could even share the, the, the revelation he has there. It starts yes. with echoes of Sinai, but ends differently. Yes, it's really, it's really this, uh, this struggle in the Jewish tradition between zeal and, and compassion. Or, you know, you could say between ahava and yirah, love of God and awe of God or fear of God. Right, so at, at Mount Chorev, at Mount Sinai, God says, uh, what are you doing here? And then there is a, there's a manifestation. Uh, God reveals himself or herself or itself to Elijah. But it's fascinating how the book of Kings describes it. This is the uh, first book of Kings, uh, chapter 19, I believe, 18 or 19. <laughs> 19. And first there is a, a wind, a, a powerful wind smashing rocks. And the Bible says, Lo Baruach Adonai, God was not in the wind. Then there's an earthquake, Rash, and we read, Lo Varash Adonai, God is not in the earthquake. Then there's fire, Lo Vaesh Adonai, God is not in the fire. And then comes one of the most beautiful phrases in the whole Bible, Kol Dimama Daka. The King James Version translates that as uh, a still small voice, but it's more accurately translated as uh, a sound of sheer stillness. A sound of stillness, a sound of sheer stillness. So God is not in these loud, dramatic phenomena of nature the wind, the earthquake, the fire. God is in stillness or silence. It's a beautiful um, example. It's a beautiful stimulation for meditation. God is not found in, in the loud shouting necessarily and in, in the loud clashing sounds. God is in moments of silence. And at that point, Elijah has encountered the, the silence of God, the, the pregnant silence of God. But he says, once again, Kano Kineti, I am, I am zealously zealous. He's unmoved by the vision he has. He stubbornly, I'm not leaving without my mission. And yeah. he, he's yeah. uh, rigid in a sense. He's rigid, but it's interesting. In a sense, God accepts his complaint. I mean, God says two things. God says, you know, go on, go continue on your mission. But God basically promises to punish those who are still committed to idolatry. But then God says, go appoint a successor. Go appoint uh, Elisha, a successor, and the Hebrew says, Tachtecha, in your place. And the rabbis say in one midrash, what this means is, I no longer want your prophecy. Okay, the Bible does not say that, but the rabbis, one rabbinic midrash is daring enough to say that. So God is, is, is in effect saying, you're too extreme for the people to handle. You could certainly read yeah. it that way. Yeah, and you have in the prophet, by uh, Heschel, he talks about how many of the prophets heard um, see reality or hear reality an octave higher than mm. we ordinary mortals typically hear things. Mm. And clearly Elijah is um, 
he's vibrating at a level that the people are not ready for. They're not, he's right. not able to really help them. Right. And as, as he gradually changes, you know, we'll move now to, to the rabbinic and, and Kabbalistic material. As, as he changes, he's able to, to communicate with people. He's able to reach out and touch people and inspire people. You could say he changes and, and the people are then ready to, to hear what he has to offer. It's kind of a model for spiritual maturity, for transformation. I remember when I was Orthodox, I was a little bit of a zealot. I thought mm -hmm. I knew the truth. And I mellowed out and hopefully sweetened over the years, <laughs> you know. Maybe it's like a, a stage in religious development. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Elijah, I, right. He, he never loses his passion, but he's able to, to convey it, to channel it into helping others, into preparing the way for Mashiach. He really becomes the one who will pave the way for Mashiach and announce the Mashiach. Right. And the rabbis talk about um, two kinds of prophets. There's those that are Tovea Kvod Ha'av and those that were Tovea Kvod Ha'ben those that were representing God's needs and those representing the people or defending the people. And Elijah seems to make that transition in his afterlife, not during his corporeal life. Right, he ends it, right, fire, he's still wielding fire toward the end of his life and, and punishing enemies. Uh, then his ascent to heaven, you know, is... It's fascinating. Maybe that's the last thing we should touch on on, on the yeah. Bible, but we can't can't skip that completely. Uh, Elijah is walking with Elisha by the Jordan River, and it says suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, and a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and that uh, took Elijah up to heaven. So th that's the account. Elijah is taken up to heaven, but you're left wondering: Does that mean that he died? That he died a, in a spectacular way? Or does it mean that he escaped death entirely? And it's not clear from the Bible. It's really a mystery. Okay, death itself is a mystery. And right there in the Bible, we don't know whether the Bible is, is meaning to say that Elijah became immortal or that Elijah died, but he died in a, in a beautiful spiritual way. And that's an open question, which is why the rabbis can then conclude that uh, he did not die. He's, he's up there in heaven. He's available. He's there and he can come down to, to help and inspire and uplift. Yeah, so we find this theme of immortality of the saint in many spiritual traditions. And um, Elijah is clearly, you, you talk about him being the Jewish bodhisattva and uh, that he's traveling through time uh, bringing, uh, helping us in our hour of need and bringing healing and uh, justice, teaching ethics, teaching the rabbis. But uh, can you say more about the meaning of immortality and maybe a little about the cross-cultural theme? Yeah, but because the Bible leaves it open, leaves it mysterious. In fact, Elisha, his disciple, thinks that Elijah has died. The Bible says that, that Elisha tore his clothes, right? And that's known in Jewish tradition as kriya, tearing a garment. I'm sure you've all done that or seen that or heard of that. Uh, when a close relative dies, one is supposed to tear the garment. And Elisha does that. He tears his garment as Elijah sails off to heaven. So he thinks Elijah has died. The rabbis conclude that he has not died, that he's there and immortal. So we saw at the beginning of Elijah's career, he was able to revive a child. At the end of his biblical career, it seems that he may be uh, becoming immortal. And, um, you know, that's, that's some, many people say that's the birth of religion. Religion is, is meditating on the reality of death and wondering is this the end? What comes after? So the basic question of religion, uh, you know, becomes a, a major theme in the life and the endless life of Elijah. 
what it would mean for us, you know, uh, how does that help us face death? How does uh, reading about Elijah help us deal with, with, that, with that basic human dilemma? Uh, I think, you know, for me, I, I, I like to keep, uh, I, I said, I take a wait and see attitude toward, toward what happens. Uh, after death, and the fact that that Elijah is the immortal person in the tradition, we hear mm -hmm. about other people, but Elijah is the immortal person. But the fact that the Bible leaves it open, it, it keeps you wondering. And I don't have a clear answer as to you know how to how to face that, as we you know e each day uh, becomes more precious as we age, and you can't help wondering what's on the other side of that great divide. But I don't. Um, I don't. I don't want uh, a clear answer. I think of it a little bit differently, not literally deathlessness. Mm. Um, you know, Ramana Maharshi. I have a little quote. He also, like Elijah, lived in a cave, spent time in a cave. Also, like Shimon Bar Yochai, your um, great teacher from the Zohar. I mean, he spent 17 years in silence in a cave in Arunachala in South India. And he said about deathlessness, deathlessness is our real nature. And we falsely ascribe it to the body, imagining that it will live forever and losing sight of what is really immortal, simply because we identify ourselves with the body. So I'm wondering if in his pursuit of truth, Elijah achieved deathlessness in his life, and that's why he's deathless. And it's kind of, to me, not so relevant whether, mm. you know, he's alive for all time because what he mm. represents is, it's immortal, it's eternal, eternal truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say he he has become that. What what's fascinating is how he he's really a shapeshifter, right? He takes on different forms depending on on what's needed at, at the moment. So he has shed his body, and he can assume other mm -hmm. other bodily forms. There are beautiful stories in the Talmud uh, that we we've talked about about um, who who he can become, right? All the all the different uh, forms he can take on. Uh, he can be a, a, an Arab, a Persian. He turns into a slave, a royal minister. Uh, one story, he even turns into a prostitute, which is quite shocking. But let me, let me read that uh, very brief story um, about uh, Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir, a great figure in, in the Mishnah. Uh, and it is said that Rabbi Meir once rescued his sister-in-law who had been condemned to uh, a Roman brothel. And Rabbi Meir rescued her from the, from the brothel, but because of that, a wanted picture was put up. A wanted picture of Rabbi Meir was put up. And this is what the Talmud says. They went and engraved Rabbi Meir's image at the entrance of Rome and proclaimed, anyone who sees this face, bring him. One day, some Roman officers saw him and ran after him. He ran away from them. Some say that Elijah appeared to the pursuing officers as a prostitute and embraced Rabbi Meir. The officer said, perish the thought. If this were Rabbi Meir, he wouldn't have done that. And so Rabbi Meir was saved. So Elijah is able to do something which seems so sacrilegious, so wrong. But in that particular situation, it was what, what, saved, what saved the rabbi. Is it is part of the shape shifting a way of saying that there's holiness in every situation that the beggar you meet on the street or even a prostitute could have that spark of Elijah, that holiness, and that there's no place devoid of divinity. Is yeah, I think I think that's part of the message of of Elijah, and then eventually Hasidism says each of us has one spark of Elijah within us. We 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 can draw on that inner zeal or that passion, 
but learn how to how to channel it to compassion. Have there been moments in your journey as a in your study where you have felt a visitation of Elijah helping you, helping you uh, understand or translate? And what is that like if you've had that experience? Uh, I, I would say I, I just feel like I've, I've gotten to know him better and better. I was always intrigued by, by who he was as a, as a child. But my father was a rabbi and uh, Shabbat, of course, was very important to us. And we would always end Shabbat by singing about Elijah. That's very common to sing about Elijah at Havdalah at the end of Shabbat. But in our family, we would sit around the living room for a little while before that, you know, late Shabbat afternoon and sing songs and tell stories. And one song we always sang was a beautiful song about Elijah. So he, he was just impressed on my memory from a very, very impressed in my mind at a, a very early age. And I think that's partly why I took on this project of, of writing about him because I, I could never figure him out. You know, people are always frustrated or disappointed when he doesn't show up at the Seder. You hear these fantastic stories about Elijah saving someone. And then the, you have the biblical account, which is so stark and dramatic and full of zealotry. So he was a mystery to me, but, but he was such an important part of, of every Shabbat, the conclusion of Shabbat, especially to me, that uh, I wanted to know more about him. I, I don't know if I've uh, had what's called Gilui Eliyahu, a revelation of Elijah. That's the term in Jewish sources for an encounter with the prophet. I wouldn't claim to, to have had that, but I feel, I feel something of his presence, uh, of his power. And what I wanna do is really not, not so much to see him or encounter him, but to, to experience what he experienced. And I mean, especially that, that moment of uh, finding God in the kol de mama daka, in that sound of sheer stillness so he inspires me to to meditate yeah you you talk about elijah as a liminal figure both human and angelic and traversing heaven and earth different realms and uh that he appears at liminal moments can you say a little more about that yeah, he's, he's the person who's in between. One author has called him the, the virtuoso of the in-between. He's straddling, he's, he's, he's bridging. Uh, he's, you know, he's the, trans, the, he's the transition from, from life as we know it to the messianic age. He's the one who makes that transition. But already in the Bible, he's, uh, you know, he can be taken away at any moment. The spirit of God can, can carry him off. Uh, but you think of who he became, he's connected with, with moments of, of transition, liminal moments, as they're called. Havdalah, right, is the, tra the transition from Shabbat back to the weekday world. And Elijah appears there. Elijah appears at every circumcision, welcoming the Jewish baby boy into the tradition, into the, into the Jewish fold. Uh, he... He is the one who in, enlightens the mystics. Some people call him, um, one scholar has said what Moses was to the Torah, Elijah was to the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. So he is the one who inspires the mystics and shows them new understandings of God. Because as you mentioned a, a few minutes ago, not only does Elijah evolve, but God evolves in the Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. And we see that it's almost side by side. Elijah learns to move from zeal to compassion and god's compassionate nature unfolds gradually from the bible to the talmud to kabbalah and hasidism in a way would you say that elijah is a precursor to shechina uh yeah both of them really could be <clears throat> identified with, with ruach hakodesh with the holy spirit i would say that elijah really embodies the holy spirit that's his role, inspiring the mystics, inspiring the rabbis. Mm -hmm. He can report what happens in the heavenly academy. This is already in the Talmud. According to the Talmud, God is teaching in the heavenly academy. He's teaching the souls of the righteous. 
And Elijah is there. Elijah is one of the members of this academy. He's enrolled in, in the courses there. And then he reports to earth. Again, the, the liminal figure, the in-between. He reports what God is thinking. He reports what God is feeling. Many of you may remember the story in the Talmud where rabbis are arguing and one rabbi refuses to give in. He says, I refuse to give in. If I'm right, let that river flow backwards. The river flows backwards. The rabbis say, we, we don't listen to rivers. He says, if I'm right, let that tree be uprooted. The tree is uprooted. Doesn't make a difference. Finally, he says, if I'm right, let the walls of the house of study collapse. They begin to collapse. But one rabbi there says, wait a minute, the Torah was given to us by God. It's no longer in heaven. We decide what the Torah means. And the conclusion of that story is one rabbi met Elijah one day and said, Elijah, what was God saying at that moment when the people decided to follow their own decisions? And Elijah says, God said, my children have defeated me. My children have defeated me. It's an amazing, profound story about the power of, of human interpretation. Uh, but what's, what's significant, the reason I told her is because Elijah is the one who tells us what God is feeling. Elijah is able to, mm. to bridge heaven and earth uh, right. in that way too. Yeah, that's, and you beautifully describe uh, Elijah in other faith traditions, the two daughter religions that in Christianity and Islam, Elijah appears with a similar um, personality that you're describing. It's re that's really fascinating that uh, now if Elijah is going to announce the coming of the Messiah, and that's already hinted at in the Bible itself, the prophet Malachi, the very end of the last prophet in the in the in Hebrew scriptures, Malachi, the end of that book of Malachi, uh, it says, <clears throat> I'm sending to you, Elijah the prophet, before the day of Hashem, before the day of the Lord. So that's understood by the rabbis to mean that Elijah will announce the Mashiach. Yeah, so it, he he's opening the door to a different world, a different right. uh, realm. And we opened the door to Elijah. I know we're <laughs> going to save Passover for the end of uh, this yes. conversation. Yes, but I, I'll continue but, to answer your question. Right. Yeah. Uh, you were saying about Christianity and Islam. Yeah. So because Elijah is going to announce the Messiah, it would make perfect sense for him to play an important role in the New Testament. And in fact, he does. Elijah is a major, I would say, a significant figure in the New Testament. Who, who is he? He must be John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the one who anoints Elijah. And um, according to the New Testament itself, Jesus says that Elijah the Baptist is, is Elijah. That, 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 that John the Baptist is Elijah. So Jesus makes that, that statement. But more interesting is that Jesus himself may have thought of himself as Elijah. At one point, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, some people say that you're Elijah. It's very possible that, that Jesus saw himself as a prophet or as a prophet come back to earth. So Elijah is significant there. And the immortality theme of Elijah's immortality and Jesus. The immortality too, right? What's interesting, Jesus also goes up to heaven and that <clears> reminds <throat> us of Elijah's ascent to heaven. What's interesting is that Jesus definitely dies and then goes to heaven. With Elijah, we don't know if he went to heaven without dying, but there's some, uh, there's, a, there's a very clo close parallel there. And in Islam, uh, we have a mysterious figure, Al-Khidr, uh, that would be spelled A-L, meaning the, and Khidr, K-H-I-D-R. Al-Khidr means the green one. This is a, a figure who appears in Islam, not mentioned in the Quran itself, but later interpreters of the Quran find Al-Khidr in the Quran. Al-Khidr is similar to Elijah. He can appear in different guises as an old man and uh, various different human forms. He inspires people. Some of the great Sufis claim that they received the mantle of Elijah. 
this mantle is the same mantle that Elijah threw upon Elisha to to uh, to to declare him as a successor, to mark him as a, as a successor, and that Aderet Eliyahu, the mantle of Elijah, becomes the mantle of Al Khidr, uh, one of the greatest of all the Islamic poets and mystics, Ibn Arabi describes two times where he received the mantle of Al-Khidr. So a Muslim mystic will be inspired by Al-Khidr as a Jewish mystic might be inspired by Elijah. And I think that's two ways to talk about how the Holy Spirit, how the Ruach HaKodesh manifests in the world. Yeah, and some of the tales about Elijah and Elisha are repeated in the New Testament, the reviving the dead child and the right. feeding the the bread becoming enough for infinite sharing. Right, exactly. The miracles of Elijah and his disciple Elisha become the model for the stories about Jesus. And Jesus uh, alludes to, to Elijah and, and Elisha as well. So um, the rabbis would um, often have visitations by Elijah, and Elijah would teach or illumine, often offering a ethical teaching. And sometimes Elijah would disappear uh, hmm. and withdraw from the relationship. What would cause Elijah to appear and what would cause him to disappear? Yeah, you, ha you have many stories in the Talmud and the Midrash of rabbis encountering Elijah or studying Torah with Elijah. Some of them had a, apparently a pretty long standing relationship with Elijah. Elijah would come to them regularly and then Elijah suddenly wouldn't show up one day. And usually it was because of some very minor ethical mistake that a rabbi made. Uh, one, one person uh, who he visited uh, put a gate around his house. You wouldn't mm -hmm. think there's anything wrong with putting a gate up, but the gate prevented poor people from coming and approaching and asking for help. So because uh, this figure built the gate, Elijah didn't show up. And then he finally shows up to explain why he didn't show up. So he, he's an ethical uh, extremist. You could say already he's channeling his zeal into ethics and in fact, the rabbis speak of something called uh, Mishnat Hasidim. Uh, Elijah mentions this, the Mishnah of the Hasidim, the Mishnah of those who are especially devout. This goes beyond the normal requirements of the halacha, what you should do you know, to, to, help, to help those in need. Elijah is the one who insists on going beyond the, the letter of the law, and he won't come back to see you unless you care for, for others. Sort of like Elijah in the scriptures is Haredi, and then he becomes a reform rabbi <laughs> in the sense of emphasizing ethics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, you know, it, it's hard to pin him down. Certainly, we have that transformation, but you, you know, you find roots of his, of his compassion in the Bible, and you find some of occasionally his zeal uh, shows through even in, in later stories. Your, your title, Becoming Elijah, I would say the last chapter of your book where you talk about what it means to become Elijah is so beautifully written. I just was underlining every other sentence. Can you say a little about how each of us can become abyssal Elijah? Yeah, that... The title of the book, Becoming Elijah, it's, uh, it's kind of intentionally uh, ambiguous. You know, on the one hand, it means what we've been talking about, how Elijah becomes who he becomes, how he changes over time, how he turns his zealotry into compassion. And that, you know, that's a, a, an endless story, but that's, that's what's one of the most fascinating things about him. But at the end of the book, I, I explore the Hasidic notion uh, what's called Bechinat Eliyahu, an aspect of Elijah, a quality of Elijah, a spark of, of zeal within each of us. So this could be uh, a creative urge. It could be a moment of, of breakthrough 
an intellectual breakthrough or a psychological breakthrough, seeing something, uh, ha having, having a, a minor revelation. That, that possibility exists within each of us. And Hasidism calls that the, the quality of Elijah, the spark of Elijah. One of the things that shows it, one of the ways it manifests is if you're eager to spread good news. Okay, we've mentioned before that, that Elijah brings some bad news, but in general, he's the master of good tidings, right? That, that uh, ancient English word. He's the master of good tidings. He's the one who will announce the Messiah. So his specialty is bringing good news. If you're eager to bring good news to somebody, it doesn't have to be about you know, the Messiah. It could be uh, something wonderful or beautiful that, that's happening or that will shortly happen. The eagerness to spread good news, according to Hasidism, that is the quality of Elijah. You're, mm. you're, you're overflowing with some joy and, and you don't want to selfishly hold on to it. You can't help yourself, but spread it. That's Elijah working through each of us. It sounds like something very, you know, almost too mundane. But again, it's bridging the spiritual and the everyday, seeing the, the glory, seeing the wonder in the everyday. That ability is also part of, uh, part of Elijah's magic. I should say, too, tikkun here is very significant. Tikkun, the repair because Elijah changes, because he's able to transform himself, he's a model for us. In other words, he, he, he was extreme. He was violent. He feels rage. Part of this is really how can, how can we transform rage into compassion? So because Elijah does that, he's able to inspire that, that growth, that transformation within us. Your, your book came out at a very timely moment. Uh, it's two weeks to Passover. And I have to say, from my childhood, uh, the, the most beautiful moments of the year, Jewishly, the most beautiful moments were the moments when we would open the door to Elijah. And I can even remember as a child watching uh, the Elijah cup and I always would, we would, I think my father used to shake the table so it looked like Elijah was taking a sip and he'd spill a little <laughs> bit of the wine. <laughs> but I think about that, that op, like the opening of the door as, as a kind of parting of the veil of reality, like reality right now is kind of dark. But even in the midst of <clears throat> the darkness of this moment, in time, Elijah opens the door to the possibility of hope, of uh, that, that things will change, that like you can invite in the future into the here and now. Maybe that's hmm. also the meaning of Gilui Eliyahu. Yeah, that possibility of hope, the possibility of, of, of salvation. You could say Elijah really made it possible for people to maintain the belief in Mashiach. You know, Mashiach seems so far off and, and always failed to come when, when the Jews needed it, needed him, needed her. And Elijah is someone you can picture. It's hard to picture the Messiah, right? The Christians can easily picture the Messiah. For Jews to picture the Messiah is difficult. Elijah, you can picture. So Elijah gives you that, that hope that, that something can change, that there's a, a better day. So Pesach, why is Elijah connected? Why, does he, why is he at the Seder? I'm sure for many of you, for most Jews in the world, uh, we don't know about, right? Most people have not read the book of Kings recently or, or closely. Most people don't know so many of the stories about Elijah in the, in the Talmud or the Midrash or the Kabbalah for sure. But we know of Elijah because of what you described, because of, of those magical moments of having the cup on the table and opening the door for Elijah. So why does that happen? It happens basically because Elijah is going to announce the Mashiach. And traditionally, the Mashiach will come on Pesach. The Mashiach will come on Pesach because Passover is the celebration of the original redemption from Egypt. So it also is the appropriate time for, for the final redemption. So it would make sense for Elijah to be there. The Torah has a beautiful phrase about uh, the first night of, of Pesach, first night of Passover. It calls it Leil Shimurim, 
a night of watching. So this refers to God watching over the children of Israel in Egypt during that terrible last plague when the firstborn of the Egyptians are killed. The Israelites are protected because of, of blood that's been placed on, on the doorpost. And God is protecting the people. It's a night of protection, a night of watching. But the rabbis took that to mean it's the night of watching, of, of expecting, of mm. expecting the redemption and expecting Elijah to come. If the Mashiach will come, then Elijah should, should come. And that's the main basic reason why Elijah is associated with the Seder. But what's going on with a cup of wine and the door? This is fascinating. There's no clear beginning to either of these customs. And this is often the case with, with religious practice. This custom developed, we don't know exactly how, it took hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible or the Talmud or the Midrash, nothing about Elijah drinking a cup of wine, nothing about opening the door for Elijah. So how did that happen? Well, because it's a night of Shimurim, because it's a night of watch, it was considered a night of protection and there developed the custom of leaving your door open. Jews do not have to lock their doors on the night of Passover, according to this tradition, because it's a night of Shimurim, it's a night of protection. So the door is left open, not for Elijah, the door is left open just because we're not worried, we're not, we're not afraid. But gradually, we have, for example, in the 11th century. Again, the 11th century, a man named Nisim Gaon, this is what he says. Okay, this is long after the Talmud, still no mention of Elijah in any written text. Here's what uh, Nisim Gaon writes in the 11th century. I saw that my father would not close the doors of our house at all. And until now, this is our custom. And on the night of Passover, the doors of the house are open. When Elijah comes, we will go out to greet him quickly without any delay. So this is interesting. You're opening the door, not so Elijah can come in, but so that we can go out. Mm. Maybe Elijah will finally come this year. Maybe the Mashiach will come. And if he comes, we want to get to him right away. So this is the 11th century. You're opening the door so that we can go out and greet him. Now, let's skip uh, a little bit. 400 years later, we find this about the cup of Elijah. I've seen some people. This is a man named Zelikmin Binga, writing in the 15th century. I've seen some people on the night of Passover who pour a special cup and place it on the table, saying that this is the cup for Elijah, the prophet. And I don't know the reason. He's saying, I don't know the reason. This is a rabbi in the 15th century. He doesn't know the reason. But it seems that the reason derives from this. If Elijah the prophet comes on the night of Passover, as we hope and expect, he too will need a cup. He'll need a cup of wine. <laughs> For even a poor person among Israel must drink no less than four cups. And if the cup is not ready, we'd have to prepare it for him, which might delay the Seder. Okay, the worst thing would be to delay the Seder, but the Seder is long enough as it is. You don't want to spend five minutes pouring the cup. So it's amazing. The door is open, and then it's connected with Elijah. A cup is poured because if he's going to come, he'll need a cup of wine. So those are a couple yeah. highlights about uh, how he entered the Seder. At, at our Seder, we each pour a little bit of the remaining wine from our cups into the Elijah cup and we pour all our hopes and dreams and wishes mm -hmm. for the world and for humanity into the Elijah cup. So it becomes in a way the chalice of blessing. Right. He's really it's really the opening, as you said before, he's really the an opening for 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 whatever is needed. And that's why the, all the different forms that Elijah takes on, it really shows you more about the Jewish people, what they needed, what they wanted, what they, what they dreamed of. They, they project that onto Elijah. They recreate right. him in each generation. Hope is a very powerful force. Without hope, mm. um, you can easily fall into despair when the lights are out, when, when life is tough. So being able to see possibility, to see beyond the moment, which is in a way inviting the future into the present moment, that that's the power Elijah gives us. That's great.
And, you know, Elijah is the perfect person for that because he, he felt despair. He was sunk in deep mm -hmm. despair after that, after the winning the contest and Jezebel threatening his life and running away before he gets to <clears> Sinai. <throat> we talked about his getting to Mount Horeb, but on the way there, he stops in the desert and basically, basically he has a, 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 right, basically a, a death wish. He asks God to take his life. He feels he's failed totally. He realizes the people have not been brought back from worshiping Baal and Asherah, and he falls into such deep despair, and then he overcomes that, and he's a model for, for what you're describing there. I'd, I'd like to read one, uh, one brief thing here, um, which is a beautiful example of how Elijah combines uh, tradition and mysticism. In some ways, he's the most traditional figure in all of Judaism. He's the most popular figure in Jewish folklore. Uh, I should mention, you know, King David or Moses or King Solomon appear frequently in Jewish folklore, but nobody appears even half as much as Elijah appears because of, of his special role and because of all the forms he can, he can take on. But I want to read uh, a short thing written by a mystic, a Jewish mystic, about how you can attain a revelation of Elijah. Okay, we've been using this phrase, Gilui Eliyahu revelation of Elijah, meaning an encounter with Elijah, receiving some message, some insight, some wisdom. So there was one great Jewish mystic, Chaim Vital. He was the most prominent student of Isaac Luria, uh, living in Sfat. And this is what he says. He says, the way to, to stimulate revelation of Elijah involves this. I'm not quoting now, I'm just paraphrasing. This is what you need to do if you want to have a, a revelation of Elijah. Teshuva, turning back to God, fulfilling the mitzvot, the commandments, sincere kavana, sincere intention during prayer, intense study of Torah. Okay, up to there, there's nothing mystical at all. This is just being a good observant Jew. Mm -hmm. But then he goes on, an ascetic lifestyle, limiting food, drink, and sensual pleasures, seclusion, okay, going into our cave. We've all had a long opportunity to do that, but this is seen in a very positive light, seclusion, immersion in a ritual bath, in a mikvah, meditation on the divine name, emptying one's mind of worldly concerns and love of God. And then this is one sentence with which uh, Vital concludes, through these practices of devotion, Elijah will reveal himself the greater one's devotion, the greater Elijah's revelation. So Beautiful. it's fascinating because he's talking about a mystical experience, but how do you cultivate that? How do you stimulate that? By devoting yourself to the most traditional things possible, but then going within, uh, cherishing that silence, that sound of sheer stillness, learning to appreciate, learning to hear that sound. Beautiful. Can you hear our tone? Can you hear so I'm tone? wondering if we could uh, tell an Elijah story for Passover. Uh, maybe you want to tell the Hasidic story that's in your book about the Hasid who sure. complains that Elijah never comes. Right, as many as many of us feel, or as many children feel, a num number of people have told me this too, that's that, that disappointment of Elijah not coming. This is a story about that. I'll just read uh, a short passage here from near the end of the book. According to a Hasidic tale, a pious Jew once asked his rabbi why Elijah never appeared on the night of the Seder, even though the door was opened for him and his goblet of wine was waiting on the table. The rabbi told him, there's a very poor family in your neighborhood. Go visit them and propose that next year, you and your family will celebrate Passover with them in their house and that you'll provide everything they need for the whole holiday. Then on the night of the Seder, Elijah will certainly come. The man did as he was told, but after the following Passover, he returned to the rabbi complaining that once again, Elijah had failed to appear. The rabbi responded, Elijah came, but you couldn't see him. Holding a mirror to the man's face, he continued, look, this was Elijah's face that night. Right. 
That's becoming Elijah. So he became, he succeeded yeah. in becoming Elijah with the rabbi's help. That's the ultimate shape shifter. <laughs> <laughs> when you can see the face Beautiful. of Elijah where you least expected, including yourself, that you could be the messenger of Sorot Tovot, of the good news, mm -hmm. right? So maybe we'll pause here. I don't know if there's a question or we had invited if anybody had a question to put it in the chat. There, there is indeed a question um, from Jeffrey. You spoke a little bit about this already, about the Bechinat <coughs> Eliyahu, um, the spark of zeal in each of us. Um, Jeffrey's also wondering where and how the Bechinat Elijah is active in our times, maybe more on a societal level. And, and I'm also thinking that that zeal, I can see that in the world taking both positive and negative forms. So maybe you could speak a little to the Bechinat Eliyahu. Yeah, the Bechinat Eliyahu. You know, it's funny, the Hebrew word Bechina, those of you who know Hebrew, you would usually translate that test, a test of Elijah. But the word also means a quality or, or an aspect. So the Hasidic claim is that is that everyone has the aspect, and it's not something to, to wait for. It's not something in the future. The way the Hasidic text uh, shows that is by quoting the verse from Malachi, from the prophet Malachi, where God says, I'm sending you Elijah. But the Hebrew has it in the present tense, sending you. It doesn't say, I will send. It says, I am sending you. So the Hasidic source says, well, that shows us that it's happening now. The possibility is there within each of us. I think to, to contact that spark of Elijah or that aspect of Elijah, one has to slow down, one has to quiet down. And really we come back to that moment at Sinai and the sound of sheer stillness. So I think the way to, one way to contact that quality of Elijah is to, is to stop, to pause, to, to learn how to dwell in silence, and then something within, something deep within will, will emerge. You find a discussion in, in the earlier Kabbalistic texts about, are you, are you seeing someone out there or is, it, or is it an internal process? And you find a discussion back and forth about that. One phrase that I'd love is uh, the beyond within, to look for the beyond within. And Elijah is a, a manifestation of that, of that spiritual is, search. Is that the transcendent become imminent? The beyond yeah. within? Yeah. And is there a difference between Bechinat Eliyahu and Bechinat Mashiach that the Hasidic rabbis speak about? Yeah, I mean, Elijah and the Messiah are, are a pair. And sometimes uh, it almost seems like a joint venture. Some things that Elijah will do and some things that Mashiach will do and different, different sources, you know, attribute different, different uh, goals, different tasks to each one. But they, they really, um, they're, they, they, they know each other well or Elijah is, is paving the way. You know, this also explains why Elijah is, is sung about on, on Saturday night and at the end of Havdalah because Shabbat is a taste of Messiah. So it makes sense for Elijah to be there uh, with Shabbat and maybe Shabbat will turn into Mashiach. And again, Elijah is the one in between, the liminal figure connecting Shabbat to, to Mashiach. Maybe that's Elijah's um, final uh, shape-shifting as he uh, then becomes Mashiach. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. But, you know, you know that, that Mashiach, it, in that sense, is not so much a person we're waiting for as it is a, a state of awareness. So Elijah is the one who spreads that awareness and that could turn into a, a messianic reality. You know, as, as Franz Kafka has this beautiful line, the Messiah will come on the day after his arrival. He'll come when he's no longer necessary. So it's not that we should wait for Messiah to come. It's that we should build a messianic reality and a big part of that Part of that is political, and part of that is grounded in events of the day, and part of it is an internal spiritual process, and that's where Elijah figures. 
Well, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Maybe, maybe I'll just ask, um, you are somebody who has um, a writing habit is, is how Norman Fisher puts it. I'm just wondering if now that you've come out with this book, if you have a little inkling in the back of your mind of what might be your next writing project, or are you gonna just sink into the still silence for a little while? <laughs> Uh, I'm working on something that very long term now, but it actually relates to, to my commentary on the Zohar. Uh, that is now being translated into Hebrew, and I'm going over it very carefully with the translator. So that's going to keep me busy for, for a while, and I don't know, uh, I don't know what's, what's next. <laughs> something will come out of the, out of the silence, I'm sure, or the spark of skill. Thank you. <laughs> Well, this, this has really been a wonderful conversation. I want to thank Daniel and Estelle and their energy together. Um, the, there was a recording. So um, if you would like to, to listen again, you can email shalom at hochmat.org for a copy of the recording. Um, we also are putting again in the chat the 25% um, discount codes if you want to purchase Becoming Elijah and of course, information about how to stay connected to Daniel with his online courses on the Zohar. Um, we always appreciate deeply your contributions to sustain this community. Um, if you wanna support this kind of programming and see more of it, please consider making a donation. This is a wonderful time to join Hochmat if you're not already a member and to rejoin if you've let your membership lapse. Um, as we start a new chapter with our new spiritual leader, Zvika Krieger. And we also hope that everyone will come tomorrow night to our Shabbat service on Zoom at 5.30 p.m. And Zvika will be leading his very first um, Shabbat service with us. So thank you everyone for um, coming and attending and hearing this wonderful um, program um, and um, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Estelle. Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye. Chag everybody.